word brings light and illuminates our minds and helps us to connect with you, to receive from you. And we just pray that you do only what you can do here this morning to give us revelation knowledge, to inspire us, to help us, and to sh show us the thing you want us to hear from you today. And we just remember all our members who are not here, those who are uh, recovering. We want to thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed. We thank you for those who are traveling, that you are protecting them. We thank you for our children, those who are still in university, that you will bring them back safely. We thank you for those who are struggling in any way, form or shape, that, Lord, you bring them out of these struggles and help them to overcome in Jesus' name. And this morning, as we share from your word, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will, will help us and demonstrate himself in our midst today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as you know, this is Christmas season. Um, I have a custom, uh, something I do traditionally. About the beginning of November, I begin to play my, play my Christmas carols. And everybody in my household, they wonder where uh, we have, have come from. Um, but it's good. I just want to be in Christmas mode. I wish I could do it in June, but people say it's a taboo not to play Christmas carol in June. Because I just love those carols, you know, they bring back, you know, people who wrote these things, they, they kind of thought about what must have happened at the time Jesus was born. And so they pen some of these songs and they inspire us still. Some of them are hundreds of years, even thousands of years old. And we just want to thank God for Christmas season. So, um, um, we are preparing to celebrate Christmas and we will trust God that we will really have a great celebration this year. So, as a church, we want to focus on Jesus, as we do every time. But particularly at this season, we want to focus on Jesus, his person, his nature, and the fact that, you know, Jesus came one time as a baby, but he had pre- he had been in existence for all the eternity. There was a time when he was born as a baby. I know that's, that is something to, to, to think about. But you know, he's not, no longer a baby. He is the king of kings. And one day he shall appear again in glory and splendor. And all eyes shall see him. And every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, for every seed you sow in terms of proclaiming Jesus, witnessing Jesus, demonstrating Jesus, just be rest assured, God is going to use it. You may think, oh, I haven't done enough. But God says, the little you do, I can cream it. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one that waters. So, just be in the flow. Amen? So today, I just want to remind us about uh, our text is going to be Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Aren't you glad about that? Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, today we just want to uh, dwell on those phrases of the titles of Jesus and what they mean to us as we sit here in 2023 and what they will mean to us for all of eternity 
Now, but before we get into that, let me just make a few comments about the, 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 the phrase for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. If you are familiar with Hebrew writing, there's what you call repetition to make emphasis. So when something is repeated, same things, similar things are repeated, it's bringing them into emphasis to take, take notes. So when he says, a child is born and a son is given, as we know, Jesus was a human being and he was God. He was fully human and fully God when he came. And just for your information, he still has his human form on the throne right now. So you have a representative in heaven. Aren't you glad? Yeah. And that brings hope immediately to us that one day you and I shall have a resurrected body. Aren't you glad? Amen. For those who are seemingly okay physically, you can dream of something much, much better. And for those who may struggle, I also have news for you. You're going to have a resurrected body. And it's not going to be like this. No pain. No, you know those things that happen. Particularly when you get past 20. So, there's hope for all of, all of us. But when he says a son, a, a child, a child is born. You know, he had to come in the form of a human being to be able to justify the requirements of the Father to redeem us, to be our substitute. And we should bear that in mind. But he was not born like you and I. You and I were born of the seed of a man. So we were born sinners. He was born of the seed of God. So he was not a sinner. And he never committed sin. That is the difference. And then he says, a son is given. When you hear the word give, what does, it, what, what does it portray to you? A gift. So a son became a gift to you. And this son was the eternal son of God. With the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he was given to us as a gift. And when something is given to us as a gift, what do we do? We receive that gift and we treasure the gift. So he was deity, a divine person who walked on this planet so that he could live and show us how to live in connection, dependence on God, the Father, so that we could you know, do the works of the Father. Then he says, um, the government will be upon his shoulder. You know, that is a prophetic statement. Because the government of Jesus, even though it's been established, is not in its fullness at the moment. That's why you still have pockets of government all over the place. But his government which is the kingdom of God, is going to subsume everything. It's going to be the everlasting government in the universe. But this statement will be realized in fullness in the millennium when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom. But at the moment, we can see the evidence of this government in action. Because every time a life is transformed from darkness into light, that is the proof of his government. Every time you see things that are happening, that are bringing hope and help to people, that is a sign of his government. Every time you see someone sitting by a homeless person trying to help them to understand life, that is God, Jesus' government in demonstration. So the government is in action right now and is happening all around us. But it's not full yet. And so we've got to be mindful of that. Because this government, as someone will say, what does that government really look like? It looks
looks like the king of the government. Because every government, if you, if you, particularly if you look around the whole world, you find that nations are being governed by individuals. And sometimes when someone comes you know, into power, they begin to show their color. So you have tyrants, when they are in government, it's a government of tyranny. When good people are in government, it's a government of goodness. So the government of Jesus reflects him. And he is that king, he is that son of God who has been given to us. But of our particular interest today are those titles which mentioned, because those titles actually reflect his nature. You know, they, they are just virtually echoing aspects of his character. They describe who he is and what he has come to do. And so when you say Jesus is the wonderful counselor, it means that that describes who he is and what he is doing. I mean, the word wonderful is very interesting. You know, I, I, I love words, and I love researching into words. But the best definition of wonder, wonderful that I can, that came up across was, of course, something that makes you to wonder. But more importantly, is something beyond your understanding. Because when something wonderful happens to you, you can try to understand it, but your head cannot wrap around it. So when a miracle happens, can you, can you tell me what just happened? You just wonder. So when someone stands up from a wheelchair and someone who has not been touched by anything, you know that's a wonder. That is something that blows your understanding. You cannot describe it that, oh, one plus one, we put this there and we put that there and that happened. But when that word wonderful is coined with counselor, Counselor simply means someone who counsels, someone who gives advice. When he says Jesus is the wonderful counselor, it means that it's the one who can give you an advice that will blow your mind. That is not something you can say, you know, from your uh, logical uh, training. We put this together. And so Jesus has been given to us as our wonderful counselor. He's the one that can counsel us, you know, with the right kind of counsel at the right time for the right things. So which means God wants to help us. And so in order for us to have the right kind of counsel, he's given his only begotten son, Jesus, to be able to give us that counsel. So when we need that advice, once we recognize that there is one place we can get that counsel, that should be the place to go. But someone may ask, I don't see Jesus physically, but I need counsel. But the answer is, when you pray, he has a million ways of counseling you. He can use other people. Have you ever been in that place where, you know, you are looking for some information? By the way, we have Dr. Gugu, as someone always tells us. <laughs> okay, that is part of <laughs> what God uses. God uses everything in the universe. But he can use other people. Like someone said, one time he was sitting in a place and someone um, spoke to a lady in the, in the tube about Jesus, about something, and the person burst into tears. Because God, he never met that person before, just said, God wants me to tell you this. And phew, because God knows, he knows every single thing that every one of us is going through at any particular time. All we just need to do is to ask him, to recognize him as the wonderful counselor. The one that can give us the right counsel. You know, and when we dare believe that he can give us that counsel, 
he will definitely, definitely deliver. But first of all, we need to, as a gift, to receive him. Because if you don't receive him, he's not going to budge through you to, to force his way on you. So Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And someone said, you know, he gives the necessary counsel. He gives a faithful counsel. He gives counsel without self-interest. You know, have you ever been to, you know, um, a counselor, even a Christian counselor? And what they want to give you counsel for is so that you can pay them much more. So you get bit by bit. You know, you come today, you pay the X amount, then you say, come back next week for more counsel. And you keep going back. Okay? Because there's some self-interest involved. But Jesus never asks you to pay for his counsel. He just asks you to believe that he is the, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one that has all the information in the universe. He knows your beginning. He knows your ending. He knows your future. He knows your tomorrow. He knows your today, and he knows your tomorrow. So if you need counsel, there's only one place which I think is right to go, is to him, because he's a wonderful counselor. But one of the other ways in which he counsels us is by his spirit. You know, Jesus made a statement before he went back to heaven. He said, he will give us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will take off his own and show us. Every time I read that, I just want to love the Holy Spirit more. And that's why God says, you know, the sin, this unpardonable sin is when you sin against the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one that represents the Godhead to us right now. And we need to respect him. We need to honor him. We need to, to, to embrace him. We shouldn't speak against him. Because he is the, the, the channel by which God does everything to us now. So, I mean, I, I read in Isaiah 11, where he says, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon, talking about Jesus, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon his spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. Just like he did in the ministry of Jesus, the life of Jesus when he was on, on the earth here, the same way he wants to walk with us. He wants to give us that spirit to rest upon us. That any time we need something that can make our lives more purposeful, better, the Holy Spirit is right there with us to give us. We just need to acknowledge him. We need to recognize that he's there. Because if you don't recognize that he's there, you are not even going to listen if he speaks to you. And he does speak also through other believers. You know, sometimes someone will say, I have a word from the Lord for you. And if, you, if it's a true word from the Lord, God has you in mind. He's prepared that person through the operation of his Holy Spirit to give you that word. But we must always judge words that we are given. Don't just take everything hook, line, and sinker. You know, check whether it's in line with the word of God. Because if someone says, go and jump into, into the sea, that cannot be from the Lord. You yourself should figure that out. Or he says, go and take all your money in your bank account and give it to me. <laughs> You've got to say, where is the hammer? You know, I've got to break some heads here. So it's important for us to judge what words we're given. But we have the Holy Spirit who is available to us as the counselor. He's the spirit of counsel. He's the one that can give us the right information we need at any time. Then he talks about being mighty God, that Jesus, the Messiah, is the mighty God. You know, I, I like that word, and we've been singing about it earlier on today, because one thing that we need in this life is strength. We need power for living. Amen? Amen. And if we don't have the necessary power, we cannot be at our full tilt. We, we, can, we cannot operate the way God intends us to, to operate. And by the way, power of God is in different dimensions. For some people, it's not necessarily the, the, the 
muscles that you carry that is in demonstration. It might be the wisdom that God gives you. It might be the grace to withstand things. You know, like people like Paul and Co. that went through tough times. They had the grace of God to withstand those situations and still be writing epistles to their letters from the Holy Spirit. Amen? So strength comes in different forms. The way we need it. But God is the, is the author. Because as he said, he is the mighty God. And when you hear that phrase, it reminds us of what God describes himself to Abraham as El Shaddai. The almighty God. The almighty. The God who is all powerful. So Jesus has been given to us as the Almighty. And in this season of goodwill, this season of this Christmas, is when we remember his first coming. We should maximize every single thing he's made, he's made available to us. So if you need strength in any way, you can turn to him. You know, because he's able to provide that. You know, this, this word, mighty God, the root is from... Is, is from the, the word um, Jehovah Nisi, the God of our victory. In fact, the, the literal thing it says, the God of the battles. He's the God that helps us through our battles. And this life is filled with battles. And so we've got to recognize that God is made himself available to us to help us fight in our battles. I was reading in a place the other day, Psalm 144. He says, he trains my hands for war and my fingers for battles. God does that. You know, have you been in a battle where you feel overwhelmed? You know, David said in one place, please rescue me. My enemies are too strong for me. And if you read the story of the life of David, he conquered every enemy that came across him by the power of God. He didn't have to rely on his own strength. He called for the power of God when necessary. And God always showed up. So it, it's important for us to recognize that God is our almighty. And Jesus is the mighty God in our life. And so when you need strength, when you need power, when you need you know, any, any assistance, you can call upon him. He also says he's the God of our victory. You know, he's the God that takes you from one level of victory to another. You know, if you had victories yesterday, guess what? Another level of victory is in, you are in line for another level of victory. You just need to position yourself in God for that. So in this season, let us be reminded that Jesus is the mighty God in our lives. Then he talks about the, the everlasting Father. You know, as you know, we serve a Trinitarian God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's not saying Jesus is the, is, 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 is the, the Father. No. That word Father means protect, protector. What does the word Father mean to us in the earthly realm? The Father is supposed to protect the family. And Jesus has been given to us as the everlasting Father. He's the one that protects us, not just in the here and now, but for all of eternity. And so we've got to remind ourselves. We need to fill our minds with these things. We need to focus on these things. Because he says, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Because when you look around at the crisis in the world, at all the things that are going on around us, before us, ahead of us, our hearts can fear. But when you remember you have a Savior, you have a Messiah who has been given, who has come to show you the heart of God for you, and you rely on Him, you focus on Him, it is a lot easier to live in this world in spite of all that's going on. And then the last one, he says the Prince of Peace. I mean, that is, it needs no, no amplification or explanation. Explanation. We know that this world needs peace. And it's not the kind of peace that the world is trying to broker. It's the only peace that can come from the king himself. And we all need this peace. And we need to be stewards of this peace. To let other people know that this peace can be theirs. This peace is available. Amen? It's the peace because Jesus is the, prince, is the one who makes peace between us and God. And he's the one that can bring peace between us 
and us. And it's even the one that can bring peace between you and you. How many of you know that the greatest need for peace in a lot of people is within them? They have to be reconciled with themselves. People are in turmoil within themselves. They are not sure whether they want to agree with themselves. And the enemy steps in and creates chaos. But when we know that we have the Prince of Peace who has been given to us, and for those of us who are Christians, we've embraced him. He's now in us. It makes it a lot easier to position ourselves in that place where we can have that state of calm. Our brother's testimony was instructive, was very interesting. I don't know the phrase he used, I'm always okay or something like that. I'm always fine. That should be our song. I'm, I'm fine. Let's practice. See, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know why you're fine? Because Jesus is available to you. You can practice that when, when you are going through raging storm. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know what that does? You know, just like Jesus still the storm. When he was in the back of the boat and, you know, the storms were roaring and the disciples not having figured out what was going on. They thought this is going to drown them and Jesus, come on. I mean, even you and I have more intelligence than that. But not. <laughs> because they were still in the flesh. They were still, you know, everything was just processed by what they can see, what they can feel. So they saw that and Jesus was at the back of the boat sleeping. And they were trying to put the water out. And the Lord was asleep. You know what they said? You don't seem to care. How can you tell the caregiver, the caretaker that he doesn't care? Because you haven't figured out what or who he is. But every time we recognize who he is in our lives, we can say, I'm fine. Say, I'm fine again. I am fine. You know? Because the more you say that to yourself, the more convinced you are. You know, you believe your own words more than you believe the word of other people. I can stay here for the next two hours and tell you things, but if you don't believe yourself, I'm just telling you words. Amen? So you've got to begin to believe who Jesus is to you. And so as I close today, in this season of goodwill, I want to challenge us that let us focus our eyes, our minds, our thoughts on who Jesus is, what he has come to do, his nature. He's been given to us as a gift. And we should embrace that gift. And I read a, a, a passage, if you could please put that up, Colossians 1.27. He said, this is the mystery of the new covenant. That Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what that means? It means that every time you, you, you because Jesus has come to live in you, every time you factor him into your situation, the outcome is going to be glorious. You know, someone put it very well. An evangelist that lived about 50 years ago. He said, every time, he said he had no gift. He had nothing to offer. And he was a missionary in India. And, and the, all the other parts, American missionary in India and other parts of the world. He said, he, they will ask him to come and preach. And he will say, what can I offer these people? Nothing in me. I'm just a mere mortal. But he remembers this passage. And he says, he used this phrase, which I have coined for my own life. He said, every time I stand up, I just practice the presence of Jesus. I just practice the presence of Jesus. I just remember that Christ is in me. He's the one that will bring a glorious outcome. He's not down to me. He's not of me. There's nothing I have to offer. But whenever I look to him on the, the one in, on the inside of me, he always brings out the right outcome. And so, when I look at him, I say, he's my prince of peace. He's the mighty father. You know, he's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's a wonderful counselor. When I don't know what to say, 
or I don't know what to do about what to do. And I look on the inside that the greater one is inside of me, he will always deliver. And so, as we stand to our feet, I just want us to begin to think of Jesus right now. The one that has the ability to resolve any issues in your life. You know, just begin to, begin to tell him that I'm going to live my life from now on, you know, in that wonder of making you the prince of peace. The one that has made peace between me and God. The one that is able to, to protect me through any situation. The one that's able to give me the right counsel. The right counsel. When I need counsel about my children, about my family, about my friends, about my loved ones, about my work, he's the one that's able to provide me with the right counsel. And I'm going to practice his presence going forward. Every day I stand, I want to practice his presence. Let's begin to pray. Father, we want to thank you right now. I just pray that you remind each one of us to practice your presence in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. Let's praise God. Hallelujah.